Sports Social Podcast Network. Hey there. Did you know Kroger always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Kroger app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Kroger today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to the Daily Red, your lunchtime catch-up on all things Liverpool FC and your daily reminder that the Reds are top of the league. Also in a cup final upcoming this weekend, in the last 16 of the Europa League and in the fifth round of the FA Cup. All is going swimmingly other than the injuries. Um, We obviously know Jürgen is leaving. We have all witnessed the chatter around potential options for the next manager. Xabi Alonso is the the name who's out there most prominently. There's multiple reasons for that. Obviously, Leverkusen having an incredible season, his connections to the club. We know that other names have been mentioned. There's been a lot of talk about who the next manager will be. There's been less talk about who the next sporting director will be. Now, there's been some names out there. Tiago Pinto has been mentioned. Obviously, Tim Steepten has been mentioned. But there's one name that hasn't been mentioned, who has been linked to us in the past, who would make an awful lot of sense, who's currently on gardening leave, not working, and would be available to start this summer, And that's Paul Mitchell. And I've been wondering if the lack of links is purposeful. If we're hearing other names because they're working on a deal with Paul Mitchell. Now, he's been linked to United for years. But obviously, United have just pretty much appointed Dan Ashworth. He'll have to serve an extended gardening leave. But if United have gone for Ashworth instead of Paul Mitchell, who Ineos have tried to hire multiple times as well, it leads me to believe that maybe Paul Mitchell has something else lined up and maybe that's the Liverpool job. And I remember going back maybe a year, Miguel Delaney in The Independent reporting that we were talking to Paul Mitchell. And that's been mentioned by a few people that we we talked to Paul Mitchell that he wasn't willing to take the job on at the time because he didn't like the parameters of the role. And obviously Jörg Schmatke took over and he made it very clear when interviewed that his job was to assist Jürgen. And the sporting director shouldn't be assisting the manager. The sporting director should be above the manager he should be overseeing, in terms of recruitment, obviously, he should be overseeing the recruitment. He should be the one making the decisions, leading the way. He should be the one making the day-to-day decisions about how the football club runs in terms of academy, medical staff, et cetera, et cetera, analytics, et cetera, et cetera. And that's clearly not what the role was going to be while Jürgen stayed at the club. So I do wonder if maybe Mitchell turned us down at that point which was rumoured, along with a couple of others. Kroos from Eintracht Frankfurt being another name that was prominently linked, and he turned us down. 
And I do wonder if now that Jürgen is moving on, if maybe they'll go back to Mitchell, who did seem like their first choice to replace Julian Ward. Mitchell's <clears throat> record is pretty impressive when you look into it. So his first role was head of recruitment at Milton Keynes Dons, MK Dons. That was back in 2010. Now, at that point, he's only 29 years of age. He's only 42 now. He joined Southampton in January 2012. They got promoted in the summer of 2012. He was responsible for recruitment that summer. They brought in Jay Rodriguez from Burnley. He turned out to be an excellent buy for them. Stephen Davis from Rangers. He turned out to be an excellent buy for them. Nathaniel Klein. He turned out to be an excellent buy. May Rashida. He was an excellent buy. They also signed Gaston Ramirez, who was linked to us at the time. Now, he didn't quite work out there. Had some moments. Went on and had a decent enough career, but he didn't quite work out, but you wouldn't call him a flop either. So pretty impressive first summer. The second summer, though, that's where it's quite impressive. They bring in Danny Osvaldo. He did okay. They brought in Victor Wanyama. He was incredible for them. The one knock on him is he did sign the pebble, Dejan Lovren, but he signed him for eight and a half million and they sold him a year later for 20 million to a foolish man called Brendan. He left and joined Spurs with Pochettino. He signed Ben Davies. Well, he's still there. Signed Michelle Vorm. Signed Eric Dyer, and people will knock that, but Eric Dyer was at Spurs for the better part of 10 years and was for many years a decent player and an important player. Signed him for four million. He also signed Deli Ali, who he'd known from MK Dons. He was the driving force on the Deli Ali signing. He's also believed to have been one of the biggest backers of Harry Kane, pushing to have Harry Kane included in the first team, pushing the club not to give up on him, to give him opportunities. He signed Kieran Trippier, he signed Toby Alderweireld, and he signed Son. That's three very prominent players for Spurs in the last decade. Then in his last summer there, they didn't do a whole lot. They signed Paolo Lopez. Then they signed Wanyama, which was a big one. And then he kind of got pushed out of the way. And reports started to come out that he was unhappy, that he was considering leaving, and that he'd fallen out with Daniel Levy. And it's believed that that was over the signing of Musa Sissoko, who he was against, and Daniel Levy pushed heavily for. He served a 16-month gardening leave, and then he turned up at... RB Leipzig. And he was head of recruitment there. He was behind the deal for Amadou Hydera, Matthias Cunha, Nordi Mukieli. Vitali Janelt was a player that he was keen on there as well. He was in the academy. He oversaw some of their sales, including the sale of Bernardo to Brighton for way above market value. In his second summer there, they signed Christopher Nkunku, Hannes Wolf, Adam Ola Luckman, and Danny Olmo. And he left and he went to Monaco. And at Monaco, he brought in Axel de Sassi, who they would sell for a huge profit. He signed Crepin Diata, who was linked to us at the time. Brought in Florentino Luis on loan, signed Kevin Volland. In his second year there, he brings in Ishmael Jacobs, who's a quality player. Myron Bodu, who didn't quite work out for them, 
and Vanderson, who's been excellent. Also signed John Lucas, who's a pretty good defensive midfielder. And then his last summer, taking control of the transfers, he signed Taki Minamino, he signed Breedon Bolo, and Mohamed Kamara, player he knew from the Red Bull system. He oversaw the sale of Aurelian Chouameni for $80 million. Chouameni, I think, was done to Monaco six months before he joined, so he wasn't responsible for signing him, but he was responsible for the price they got when they sold him. And then you look at the business they did this past summer. Wilfred Singo, decent player. Fowler and Balogun, decent player. Dennis Zakaria, decent player. And Salisu, decent player. He didn't partake in that summer's business because he was leaving the club, but he would have been responsible for a lot of the groundwork that was put into some of these de- these deals. His track record is pretty good. It's not impeccable. <clears throat> it's not Michael Edwards, but it is pretty good. And I mean, if he could find us a couple of Christopher and Kunkus for 13 million, I think we'd all be fairly chuffed. He's only 42. He's got over a decade of experience. He's worked in multiple leagues. He'll have contacts in all of those countries. He's very, very highly regarded by anybody that you hear talk about him, anybody that's worked with him. Daniel Levy, who he fell out with, went crawling back to him to try and hire him again a couple of years ago. Like I said, he's been linked to United forever. He's been linked to Ineos and Nice for for years. When he was at Red Bull, they actually expanded his role. And he was overseeing Liefering, Salzburg, and New York Red Bulls for the, the Red Bull group, not just working for Leipzig, but doing that as well which is really, really impressive. So if we were looking at moving to a multi-club model, he's the type of guy who'd already have the experience and the know-how to oversee something like that. 42 is the same age as Alonso. If you could bring both of them in, that could be a long-term situation for us with... Two young men, one of whom is vastly experienced in his field, one of whom is incredibly incredibly promising in his, would likely have similar outlooks on the game. Alonso seems to have a very clear picture of what he wants his teams to do. And Mitchell has a very clear picture of what type of players he likes to target. And you go through the names that he signed, you can see all of them playing under someone like Xabi. Like he signs footballers. You could see Delhi and Hyung Min Son playing in the two roles behind a nine for Xabi. You could see Toby Alderweireld in a Xabi back three. You could see Nkunku playing for for. For Jabi, either behind the striker or as the as a false nine type, which Jabi has used a number of times. I think the two of them could work really well. I also think he'd work brilliantly with Amarim. And I think he's the type that would fit into FSG's big picture view of what Liverpool should be. I think if you Consider that FSG would ideally like to be buying players in the 21 to 24 age range and selling them when they hit 28, 29. You look at someone like Mitchell and his track record of selling players at high value. That's exactly what they're looking for. And then someone that can reinvest that money back into the team. They would prefer us to be completely self-sustaining. Like, I'm sure in FSG's ideal picture of things, Mane probably left summer 2020. Mo probably left summer 2021. And we took in 
in excess of 100 million for each of them. And then that money was reinvested in, say, four players. I think there's certain areas, like with, say, Allison with Virgil, where they're appreciative that finding elite level all time goalkeepers and center backs is tougher than finding elite level attackers. And that goalkeepers and center backs can prolong their, their prime well into their thirties. Whereas with attackers, it's rarely the case. Sports social podcast network. I think that's what their preference would be is someone that, can oversee not just buying players, but also selling and reinvesting and turning a squad over. I think if there's been a falling out with Klopp and the owners, it probably centers around Jürgen's unwillingness to turn the squad over regularly enough to refresh his insistence at keeping players past the point of them being useful. The way he's allowed so many players to leave on free transfers. I I would imagine there's been probably some crosswords in regards to that. Jürgen is very much about continuity. He's about, you know, the group. He's about the dynamic of the group. And when you get the mix right, you don't try and change it. And I don't think that's what the owners want. Now, again, There's different ways to do it. There's no right way and no wrong way. But I do feel like they would prefer us to be self-sustaining. So as example, you invest 75 million or whatever it was we paid for, for Sadio and Mo. When you sell them, you're getting back, let's say, Sadio 2020, what did Hazard go for? 110 million? Something similar to that. Mo, because he's more prominently a goal scorer than Sadio is, you'd probably be looking at 130. They probably would have liked to have gotten, say, 240 from the two of them and then reinvest that maybe in five players, you know, four in the 50 million range and one in the 40 million range, or or it could have been six or seven players you know, bring in a couple of young players for 15, 20 million here, players that you can develop, take the odd gamble, look to exploit a contract situation or a cheap buyout like we did with Tacky, who, for all the criticism, I mean, we tripled our money basically on Tacky. If all the add-ons kick in or doubled our money, whatever it was, we we made a decent chunk on him. And that's all the plan ever was there. But Jürgen didn't like to add players to the squad if they weren't going to add on the pitch to the level that he would like. He wasn't about short-termism. Jürgen was more about getting players in and having them for a long time. Whereas I think the owners, because they come from a baseball background where there's more turnover to the roster every single year, and I use roster on purpose there, it's a squad in football, it's a roster in baseball, but they're used to more churn. And there's there's definitely merit to the idea of churn in a squad, of having a couple of players leave each year and having a new group arrive in because it refreshes things, it adds new energy, it can add competition, it can maybe spur players on that are resting on their laurels a little bit, because there's no question that that's the situation that happened with us, where certain players were very much resting on their laurels. There's also no question that if Jürgen had had complete autonomy, he would have kept some of the players that left in the summer who were very clearly past the point of being useful. Um. <clears throat> he was able to force contracts multiple times for players that didn't warrant those new contracts and should have been gone from the club. But I think Mitchell would suit their vision a bit better. And I do just wonder if the lack of links, if it's a purposeful thing, if we're just doing that deal with him, putting out, you know, scuttlebutt about, oh, we're looking at this guy, we're looking at that guy but it wouldn't surprise me at all if they've already made the decision and it wouldn't surprise me if it's him. They have that interest in the Red Bull model and he's been in the Red Bull system. 
So I think he's one to keep an eye on for the sporting director role. Again, I think he'd work really well with Alonso. I think he'd work really well with Ruben Amram. I think he'd work well with De Zerbi. I think he's got a very, very modern take on the game. He's a former player. He's not long, well, he retired in 2009 because of injuries at the age of 27. But he's been in the game a long time and he's been working at prominent clubs in prominent positions for a number of years now. And he's done well everywhere. The falling out with Levy, everybody falls out with Daniel Levy. Did I say Levy and Levy? I did. Everybody falls out with him at some point. He's very difficult to work with. He does strange things. And pushing for someone like Musa Soka was definitely one of them, but it cost him, at the time, the guy who was widely seen as the best in the league at his job. This is kind of before Edwards really got his feet under him at Liverpool. Um, this is Anfield. There is a piece about the Anfield Road stand. There is a piece about the Luton game. Uh, we've got an injury update, so we'll come to that. Uh, there's a piece about the press conference. piece about Jeremy Frimpong um, saying that a transfer, you know, move to Liverpool could potentially be great for him. There's a piece about Teo Awani. Let's have a look at this injury update. It says worrying, which, you know, is worrying. Um, Liverpool will be without Alisson, Curtis Jones and Diogo Jota for the Carabao Cup final with journalists providing an update on the injury situation. So Chris Bascombe said that Jones and Jota were awaiting further tests. Um, Paul Joyce has said that Alisson could miss another six games. Jesus wept. We have no updates on Darwin or Mo. Those were rumors that came off of Twitter, so we'll wait and see if there's any truth to them. Um, Trent is likely to miss the final. Dominic is likely to miss the final. So we'd be without five starters. Five starters. Jesus. Right, let's move on from that depressing news. Uh, Bayern Munich could make shock call. Liverpool should keep an eye on as Kylian Mbappe set for pay cut. Uh, the Bayern thing is, is Alonso. Liverpool f- should have major advantage amid fresh Bayern Munich twist. Again, it's on Alonso. A lot of people just seem to be ruling out the possibility that he might stay where he is, which I think I think is actually the most likely outcome is that he decides to do another year at Leverkusen to have a bash at the Champions League with them. But we'll wait and see. Uh, there's a piece about Mo, a piece about the injuries, a piece about Rafa. Um, Liverpool players... Need to shake off Jamie Carragher tag. I'm not being asked reading that. Uh, three Liverpool players, Jurgen Klopp, could welcome back for the cup final. Liverpool and Manchester United, the truth is clear to see, even as Gary Neville gets his... Gary Neville continues to embarrass himself with his disgusting uh, analysis towards his own former club. Da, da, da. There's a piece about Caicedo, I think that is. Liverpool star can match Bakayo Saka and Phil Foden as one change could unleash a new level. There's a piece about Jota. There's a piece about Darwin. Uh, on AnfieldIndex.com, there is a piece about Liverpool's tactical adaptability. There is a piece about Cody and Diaz. There's a piece about Luis Guilherme, who's the young winger at Palmeiras. It's a piece about Mo. There's a piece about the Brentford win. And then we've got some podcasts. There is a new under pressure, a stat me up with Dave Davis and Ben Boxack. 
there is a positivity pod with Paul, Lubo, and Matt. And there is a rival recon ahead of Luton. We're going to be recording Scouted in just under an hour. Um, the Under Pressure pod that came out was the 6,000th podcast that we've released with Anfield Index. Let me just make sure that's right. I'm almost certain that's what it said. Da, da, da. Uh, yeah, 6,000. 6,000 podcasts that we have released. We began November, I think it was November, early November 2013. So just over the 10 years 6,000 podcasts, 600 a year, over 10 a week. That's a pretty staggering number. I'd love to know how many I've been on. I'd imagine it's a couple of thousand, probably, maybe 2,000, maybe not even. But I've done a lot of them. And it's been awesome. It really has. And I'm very, very fortunate that when John Ritchie and Gags decided to do a podcast back in 2013, that they decided they want some wanted somebody who might annoy people. And who else? Who else would they go to than me? That's all I have for today, folks. I'll see you all tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index. And find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. Sports Social Podcast Network.